Come on, right, John? What is faith? That's a good question. Um, we're, we're coming up to it. Just a great chapter in the book of Hebrews. For those in uh, Facebook land, we're in Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to cover the first three verses. You know, this, this chapter has been named the Wall of Faith. It's been called the Heroes of Faith, the Faith Chapter, the Old Testament Honor Roll. Uh, these are but a few titles that have been given to this amazing chapter 11 in this book of Hebrews. And this chapter deals with the primacy and excellence of faith. And it fits perfectly into the flow of the epistle. And now I'm on. <laughs> now we can hear you. That the new covenant is much better than the old. Not that you guys can hear me anyway. <laughs> but this, the first century Jews, they saw everything as a matter of works. And even after being shown the basic truths of the new covenant, the tendency for them was to try to fit these new principles about Christ into, into their mold of a self-based righteousness. Self-works-based righteousness. By the time of Christ, Judaism was no longer the supernatural system that God had originally given. It had been twisted into this uh, self-righteous work system with all kinds of legalistic requirements made up mostly by the rabbis. In other words, they took God's command for Judaism and completely twisted it into what they wanted. Kind of like we see a lot of pastors and teachers today. They just take God's word and they decide to twist it into what they want to fit their own ideologies. It was a, it became, in other words, what God gave them years ago became a self-effort, self-salvation, and self-glorification system. And it was far from the system that God had given them. And in many ways, it became a religious cult built on ethics. And as all work systems are, it was despised by God. Because it was a corruption of the true system he had given them. God had never redeemed man by works, always by faith, which is where we left off in our study uh, where the writer, uh, uh, he quoted Old Testament Habakkuk. Look at verse 38 real quick. He says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. In other words, it's always been by faith. This was an Old Testament prophet saying it was never by works. It was always by faith. So basically the two covenants are really are kind of the same. And as, as, as this chapter will make clear, the whole chapter 11 from the time of Adam on, God has always honored faith, not works. However, now we're going to talk about works. Works has always been commanded as a byproduct of faith. James confirms, James chapter 2, verse 18. Well, good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works. Can that faith save him? James goes on to say, he answered that a few verses later. He says, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But he's not done. He finished the whole context with this. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, good works complete faith. As we will see, Abraham was the perfect example. He uses a whole chapter of examples, but Abraham was the perfect example because he was actually nicknamed the father of faith. The Christian life is a life of faith. Because faith is the issue on which the matter of salvation depends. It is also the key that turns the lock on the door to eternal life. Faith is also the channel by which we receive the benefits of Christ's saving work. It is through faith, by believing, that we were saved. We didn't see Christ crucified. We didn't hear Jesus speak, did we? No. But by faith, we believe. The theme of faith connects with chapter 10, the writer where the writer has already presented the principle of salvation by faith, of which the saints named in chapter 11 are perfect examples. It's perfect flow. And these Jews who already heard powerful arguments about the superiority of the new covenant over the old, we've been talking about that for months, but in, in regard to faith, the two covenants are really the same. In other words, it's always been by faith. What he means is that the faith principle did not originate in the New Covenant. Faith was not new in the New Covenant. Faith was always faith from the time of, of Adam. As a matter of fact, it was originated before the world began. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, even, if, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption, to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And since the only way that God accepts faith in Christ, then God obviously established salvation at, the, at that time before he created the world. However, 
The way back to God, as far as man is part is concerned, is by faith. It's always been by faith and only faith. So this chapter is kind of enjoyable. It presents a brilliant series of examples and also connects us with some of the greatest episodes in the Old Testament. I love this chapter. So with all that being said, back to the title of the sermon, what is faith? Look at verse 1. He gives a very brief definition. Look at verse 1. He says, now faith is the insurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Bottom line, that's faith in a nutshell. Very brief description, but in the form of the old Hebrew poets used, the writer expresses his definition of faith in two parallel and almost identical phrases. Now, it's not a full theological definition, but certain basic characteristics of faith that are important in understanding the message that the writer is trying to get across. This verse describes, in short, the environment in which faith exists and works. Faith takes place when things hoped for but are not yet possessed or manifested. In this respect, faith deals with the future. We don't see what we're faithful in right now, do we? No. In the Old Testament times, that was a little different. Men had, men and women had to rest on the promises of God by faith. Well, guess what? They never saw those promises. But they had faith in them. They believed. God had told them of a coming Messiah. They never saw the Messiah. So again, they looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. Those at the time of the Messiah looked towards the Messiah. We, as a new covenant church, we look back to the Messiah. But it was always by faith. When what God gave them was a future hope, that's faith. A future hope is faith. Paul gave a perfect example of this when he spoke about the expectancy of faith in Romans chapter 8. Listen to this. He says, for in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Faith concerns unseen spiritual realities. Things that are perfectly seen by God, but not by us. Faith relates to things we do not yet have, to things we hope for and do not see, to things that are promised by God, but are so far unfulfilled in our actual experience. That's faith. That is what faith is. It's living in a hope that is so real, it gives the absolute, what does the writer say? Assurance. Circle that word. Assurance. The Old Testament prom the promises given to the Old Testament saints were so real to them because they fully trusted and believed God that they based their lives on. Without much light on the matter. A lot of the Old Testament, really, there are scriptures that we know pointed to the Messiah because we look back to them. But at the present time, it was kind of not very clear to them. About a, about a Messiah. It wasn't. It wasn't crystal clear to them. And God, of course, designed it that way. But they had faith in it. Why? Because it came from God. It came from God. And in spite of their trials and difficult circumstances, they triumphed because of their trust and faith in God. They were people of faith. And faith gave them present assurance and substance to what was yet future. This is why the world has no faith. Why? They can't see it. Right. They only believe in everything they see, feel, or hear. That's why the world has no faith. They have no faith. Biblical faith is certainly not just some pipe dream longing that something may come to pass in an uncertain tomorrow. True faith is an absolute certainty, often of things that the world considers unreal, stupid, and ridiculous. They think we're nuts. Yep. Because we have this blind faith. <clears throat> Christians have faith in God while the world lives on chance. That's their faith. Their faith is based on chance. Here's the definition for chance. Possibility of something. <laughs> I don't want to bank my eternal future on the possibility of something. But that's what the world does. Chance. We live by faith. If we follow a God whose audible voice we never heard, and we believe in a Christ whose face we've never seen, we do so because our faith has a reality. Mm -hmm. A 
a substance. The writer says an assurance. That's the strongest verb for belief in something. Assurance. In other words, it's an absolute guarantee of everything what God said is true. Both past, present, and future events. That's our faith. And in doing so, Jesus said we're specially blessed. He said this in John when talking about future believers. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's awesome. We're more blessed than those who are walked with them because we have not seen and yet we believe. Jesus was talking specifically to future believers without seeing the proof. Mm -hmm. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are three of my favorite characters in the Bible. <laughs> not because of their funky names, had nothing to do with names, <laughs> but their faith. Here they, they stood before a king who, who ruled the world, King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, they could see him, so they had the choice to obey a certain voice. Nebuchadnezzar's voice, who they could see and hear, or the audible voice they never heard before, was the voice of God. They didn't even hesitate who they chose. They did not hesitate. Here was their, here was their response. Without, without, to this evil, now they know their life was in jeopardy, but this is where faith kicks in. They said, this, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. Amen. <clears throat> they never heard God speak, but they saw this wicked king in front of them, but they chose to believe God, whom they never heard and never seen. Why? Faith. Faith. Now, I'm sure we're going to see them in this chapter of faith, too, but their, their response was triggered by their complete assurance. There's that word again, in their faith. The world's natural response is to trust their physical senses to put their faith in things they can see, hear, taste, and feel. They live in the physical world. The world lives in the physical world. We are not. We live in the spiritual. Scripture plainly says we are not of this world. For God chose us out of this world. The Apostle Paul confirmed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. By faith, we live as if things were other than what they appear because of what God said and promised. Because the man of God puts his faith and trust in something more durable and dependable than anything he will ever experience with his senses. Senses will lie to you. Your senses, your, your, even your, your, your conscience will lie to you, but God cannot lie. And he will not lie. And the Greek word he uses for assurance here is the word hypostasis, which is the writer used it three other times in his book. But he used it in chapter 3, verse, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 3, where he rendered Jesus the exact imprint of God's nature. He used the same word there. This term refers to real <laughs> content, real firm reality, as opposed to mere appearance. In other words, assurance is an absolute guarantee because it comes from the very word of God, the God who cannot lie. Amen. Which is why faith provides a firm ground on which we stand, waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises that scripture provides. We ain't done yet, ladies and gentlemen. Our faith has just started. Look at this crazy, <laughs> this absolute crazy globe we live on. Especially today. People are running around with their hair on fire. Why? They got no faith. They got no faith in anything. Because they only believe in what they see. What do you see? I see nothing but chaos. That's all I see. <coughs> chaos. On social media, on live TV, there's chaos. Even the commercials have all turned to, 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 to self-distancing uh, commercials. Everything's crazy. You want me? I'll tell you why. Because Satan wants to isolate you. Yeah. Satan does not want you in church. He does not want you around other believers. Who is the prince in the power of the air? Right. Satan. Who do we wrestle against? Flesh and blood? No. Powers. Principalities. <laughs> authorities. <laughs> in other words, everybody in charge of us. Right. That are controlled by Satan. Whether it's government, whether it's media, whoever it is. That's who we wrestle against. And I see a lot of Christians falling prey to this. I'm telling you, when, it's, when all this is over, who knows when? They're even trying to extend this thing for years. They're trying
trying to chip us all. That's biblical. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Ladies and gentlemen, better start packing up and praying up because we're going up real soon. Amen. Because it's getting really bad. Here. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I'm digging it. <laughs> Bring it. Bring it, Captain Chaos. I'm ready to go home. I had it with this place. Yeah. My goodness. But think about it. the Old Testament saints. They, did, they had more faith than we could even shake the stick at. Yeah. Because they didn't see any of the promises that we've seen. They didn't have God's word in front of them. They had some Old Testament scrolls. Think about that. Think of their faith. And that's why I can't wait to get to some of these examples. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's incredible. The Old Testament saints died without receiving the promises. But they got them now. They got them now. Not fully yet. But they got them now. Okay, let's start. Let's study the second part of that verse, because that's that's important too. Look where it says the second part of verse one. The convictions, the conviction of things not seen. Well, this carries the same truth, but I believe a bit further. Because it replies a response, an outward manifestation of an inward assurance. In other words, the person of faith lives out his belief. His life is committed to what his mind and what his spirit are convinced are true. You ever wonder why we live different from the world? Because we believe everything we read in Scripture. Right. That's why we're different from the world. We're not of this world. Because we, we actually believe everything we read from God's Word is true. So we're going to live that way. And we should. That's why I live the way I live. I don't live the way I used to live, the way the world lives now. I don't, I don't live my life to please myself or others around me. Now my life is completely different. I live my life to please God. It's not about this physical world. It's not about it. This is just a little platform to your eternal future. And there's only two possible destinations that you got. You can't earn heaven, so you better get on this faith thing I'm talking about now. Yep. Or you're destined for hell. There's only two destinations. Amen. But this, this second part of verse 1, I like it better. Because it, it carries the, the, uh, a physical response to an inward move, an inward change. Another way to define faith is this. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and being certain of what we do not see. Assurance is balanced by certainty. We are completely convinced the things that we are able, unable to see are very real and will come to pass. Do you ever get that heavenly picture? Do you ever get that Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, where you set your mind on heavenly things? Do you ever try to think of your eternal future? Amen. I constantly do. <clears throat> then I gotta go cut the lawn, man. It's like hey, it's way back in the world. It's just it's just crazy. I don't want to cut the lawn. I don't want to paint houses. I don't want to pay bills. I don't want to go to work. I want to live in paradise. And I'm going to live my life on earth like I am going to paradise. And I want to give you a great example before we get to the examples. Noah. Think about Noah. Yeah. He could have not possibly embarked on a stupendous, demanding, humanly ridiculous task that God had given him without absolute faith. When God produced rain, Noah had no idea what rain was. Right. There's no such thing as rain. And God told Noah, hey, I'm going to bring rain. What is that? Don't, don't worry about it. You're going to have to build a boat bigger than... There wasn't even a football field back then, so I can't even use that. And, and boat? What's a boat? And what's rain? He just believed God. He just had all his faith in God. And trust me, the whole world, the whole world was against him. The whole world thought he was nuts. I don't know how many people were on the planet at that time. It is also possible Noah didn't even know how to build a boat. He didn't even know what a boat was. But by faith, Noah believed and acted on his instructions. He just did what God told him. Now that's a man of faith. He had both the assurance and the conviction that the writer is talking about here. Assurance and conviction. Noah had them both. His outward building of the ark bore out his inward belief that rain was coming, whatever that is. I'm just going to build it because God says he's going to bring this stuff called rain. So I'm going to build a boat. His faith was based on God's word alone. 
Not on what he could see or what he had experienced or what others told him, but on God alone. That's faith. And for 120 years that it took him to build his boat, he preached in faith, he hoped in faith, he built with faith, and he was rewarded for his faith. His was the only family who survived the flood. And now he's in glory. Him and his faith are in glory. Why? Because he believed God. He had faith. The world around him thought he was absolutely insane. <laughs> well, is it any different for us? It's not really hasn't changed much. Because <clears throat> I know for a fact people think I'm nuts too, what I do every Sunday. <laughs> For how I live my life. Yeah, it's a big block that testifies. I'm a nut. <laughs> According to the world, I am absolutely insane. But the, the natural man doesn't understand that. He doesn't. And, and Paul uh, confirmed that in 1 Corinthians. They don't understand this spiritual faith. Paul said it best in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Amen. For they are foolish to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerning. The world thinks you're nuts because they don't understand. They don't understand why we live the way we live, why we teach the way we teach, why we preach the way we preach. They don't understand it. We see him who is invisible, but the unsaved man does not because he has no spiritual senses. He does not believe in God or the realities of God's realm or anything God has said in his word. He is like a blind man to refuse that there's such a thing called light just because he can't see it. There's a whole realm, and we talked about this this morning, and Pastor Bob did an amazing job Wednesday night. There's this whole realm going around us that we believe in faith. Mm -hmm. Heavenly battles that shape Earth's events are going around us constantly. That is ultimately controlled by a sovereign God, where the unsaved person believes that the world events are by chance. By chance. And that everything they see is the only thing that exists. Okay, so what I just described is the nature of faith. Now let's look at the testimony of faith. Look at verse 2. For by it the people of old received their commendation. In the Old Testament, those who put their faith in God and his word alone, not in this world, and the evidence it presents, are those whom God receives. They do not listen to the world, no matter how persuasive it was, how popular it was, or how influential it was. They only listen to God. And same today. We don't listen to the world. We don't listen to the media. We don't listen to the History Channel about God, describing who God is. We don't listen to science classes, how the, how the earth was constructed. We don't listen to any of that. We listen to God. Amen. And faith is not just one way to please God. It's the only way to please God. Fast forward to verse 11. <clears throat> Verse 6. <laughs> Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So no matter what else we may think or say or do in the name of Jesus is meaningly and absolutely worthless apart from faith. It will never be approved by God unless it's done through faith. What the world admires and strives for is wealth, power, worldly glory, recognition, and fame. That's their commendation. That's the world's commendation. That's what they strive for. That's what everybody outside of the church strives for. Wealth, popularity, fame. Am I right? Health. You want to throw in a couple more? <clears throat> Their team to win the Super Bowl? Little things like this. If they even play football this year. But all this is temporal. It's just temporal. I'm not saying strive to be an absolute nobody. I'm not saying that. But don't live your life for this world. This world's passing away. Let me read some from 1 John. Actually, go to 1 John real quick. It's, it's three books over. Go to 1 John, chapter 2. Talking about this world. <clears throat> 1 John, chapter 2, starting in verse 15. I love this text. The Apostle John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, there you go, the desires of the eyes, the pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. In verse 17, and the world is passing away, along with its desires. 
It's all going to disappear. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's why we live for God, not for the world. It's not going to last. You know what's funny, too? You won't find monuments or statues of those listed here in chapter 11. You won't. You won't find them. Why? Because they didn't live for the world. They didn't live a life that pleased the world. They did nothing to strive in the world. They just lived a life that pleased God. <laughs> Greek philosophy destroyed man's thinking about God. They called it rationalism. Which denied the very existence of the supernatural, especially God. Everybody thought these Greek philosophers were smart. They're stupid. <laughs> They're absolutely stupid. Paul confronted them in, in Athens back in, 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 in Acts, the book of Acts. But you know what? It's been down in ever since because people looked at it. People listened to it. People have been trying to tune out God since the Greek philosophers poisoned their minds of mankind. You think about today. People take drugs and get drunk because they run out of rational options. They escape the cults looking for pleasure and sense and, and reality and acceptance and meaning. They look everywhere else for acceptance and reality and meaning except the word should be yeah. focused on God and his word. But these are some of the desperate lengths to which mankind will go when they reject God. And they're only left with misery. No faith, no hope, no peace, no assurance, no confidence in their present day, and especially in their eternal future. God is their only rational answer. The only sure answer. Sure. Only God who made men can ever satisfy men. Only the God who made reason can make life reasonable. Only the God who made the universe can show man any purpose in it. Believing in God gives reason for living and for dying. Amen. And for dying. Think about all those who lived for the Lord and died for the Lord are now in glory. Are now in the promised land of, that God had promised them. And those who ignore the Lord are in eternal damnation, waiting for their eternal sentence of certain more misery. So we looked at the nature of the faith. We looked at the substance of faith in verse 2. Now the writer gives the perfect illustration of faith. This is perfect. Verse 3. For by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. The writer is really saying basically, you now listen, remember who the, the audience of this of this book was, was that the Jews, both saved and unsaved. And the writer is saying to the Jews, look, for those who have fully trusted Christ, you know for a fact that God did create the world. Every Jew knew that. Mm -hmm. You know that. So you had a head start on faith. You had a head start. You believe he created the world because he begins by the opening chapter of Genesis, their most important book in the Torah, where it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. They believed that without a doubt. And they didn't see God create. In other words, the writer saying that the Jews were riding the fence. You didn't see God create, but you believe that? Mm -hmm. So what, what made you just stop? <laughs> because you couldn't figure it out? <laughs> if you believe that without seeing it, why can't you believe this without seeing it? And you've seen it. Some of them walk with Jesus. The creation of the worlds cannot be explained by evidence that is available to our eyes. Without faith, we can't even explain the world in which we exist today. So what they did? Well, I'll tell you what mankind did. They created a lie mm -hmm. called evolution. The very lie that is being permeated in our school system. <laughs> we have kids right now in this church that don't believe in evolution. They had to do something to get a grade about it for evolution, but they know for a fact. Why? Because they believe by faith. <clears throat> but Charles Darwin couldn't understand it because he couldn't see it, so he created the lie of evolution. Man had to come up with something they could believe. All right, the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> okay, you won't believe God, but you'll believe that something was created by nothing. It just doesn't make, but this is how stupid people are. If they can't see it as evidence, they have to come up with it. I even know Christians that don't believe in creation. Uh, to me, they're not Christians. It's just a profession. <clears throat> so here in verse 3, the writer is appealing to the very word of God 
as the object of our faith. Look at verse 3 again. For by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. That's the object of our faith, the word of God. All 66 books, from the first sentence of Genesis 1 to the last sentence of Revelation, we believe every single word. Amen. That is the object of our faith. Hate to say it, guys, but 99% of the Bible has come true already. Yeah. <laughs> and there's 1% that hasn't come true yet. And that's the most important part. Mm -hmm. Right, John? I want to get back that's to the point. most important part. <laughs> that's where our eternal future <clears throat> waits us. Do you believe it? Mm -hmm. If all the other 99% of the Bible is correct and has happened, what makes you think the other 1% will not happen? Yeah. My goodness! If God's word is capable of creating everything out of nothing, surely this word is also sufficient ground for our hope? Think about it. If he created the world just by speaking it, what makes you think he's not going to take us to glory like he said he would? It's the same word. It's his word. That's why we live the way we live. Fearless. With passion in our faith. Because we're guaranteed eternal life and glory. And not only he created everything by his word, he continually speaks to creation. Chapter 1 and verse 3 of this same book, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Faith is not blind trust, wishful thinking, a, a mere manifestation of our positive attitude. It's our complete confidence in God's word. Complete. Jesus described it when being tempted by the devil. When Satan, Satan, who is the prince and the power of the era, world, the ruler of the world, it's obvious because Jesus was submitting to him here almost. Almost. When he was tempted 40 days and 40 nights, Satan guaranteed, you can have anything you want, which gives proof that Satan rules the world. Because he was, he was tempting to give Jesus everything. Although God is supreme, don't get me wrong, pay attention. But Jesus said, when everything was done, you shall not Live by bread alone. Mm -hmm. But he said, by every, not by some of the words of the word of God, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Every word. Every one. Our faith grows strong from his word. Our rest secures in his word and bears fruit from the word. Mm -hmm. This word is living and it's active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It is a lamp unto our feet. The Bible says it is a, a, a light to our path. That's what the word of God is. Amen. Scripture confirms. Read, read Psalm 119. It talks about the importance of understanding God's word. Because it's the only word we can trust. I don't trust anything other than the word of God. You can't put your trust in man. Robbie can't even trust me fully. I'm a fallible, sinful man, saved by the grace of God, but I'm just, only God we can trust fully. Yeah. Writing about Moses, the great theologian J.C. Ryle said this. This is so true. Listen to this. In walking with God, talking about Moses, in walking with God, a man will go just as far as he believes and no further. Yeah. His life will always be proportioned to his faith. I love that. His peace, his patience, his courage, his zeal, his works, all will be according to his faith. That's why I, I'm going to close with this. Let us pray as the disciples prayed. Lord, increase our faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this outstanding word. Faith is the insurance of things hoped for. I love that word. Father, I pray that you would just permeate our hearts with this truth, Lord, that we would live a life of faith, Father, that people would see faith in us, Lord, and ask, well, where did you get it from? And why do you believe the things you do? 
Help us to be example, Father, as, as we're going to look at these great examples in Hebrews chapter 11. Father, I just pray that we would emulate the faith of Moses and know that we would not be tempted by the, the pleasures of this world, Lord, or the things of this world, because your word says that this world is passing away and the pleasures of it. Help us to live a life of faith, Lord, because yours, your word is the only thing that is true. And Jesus said that you shall learn the truth and it is the truth that sets you free. So Father, thank you. Thank you for the, thank you for the perfect word of God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that reveals these truths to us. Lord, I pray if there's anybody, Father, and on social media now watching this, Lord, I pray that you would use this sermon to open up their hearts, Father, and that they would receive the grace of Christ and be saved. Father, thank you for the gift of salvation that only comes through faith, not of works. Thank you, Lord, for that. And I pray that as we take up our offering, you would bless it, multiply it, Father, use it for your glory, for the spreading of your kingdom. Here right in Palm Coast, in Jesus' most beautiful name we pray.